Welcome to the NBA Coast to Coast podcast brought to you by thelines.com. Coming to you from the West Coast, as always, Josh Lander, joined by Nate Weitzer, and he is on the East Coast. And we are looking at playoff props in the NBA playoffs on Tuesday. Getting ahead of this stuff nice and early for you guys. It is Monday as we're recording uh, halftime of this Celtics and Cavs. Pretty close game there in game four for that series. But we're looking at playoff props for the Knicks and Pacers game five, as well as the Nuggets and uh, Timberwolves. That's who they're playing. Back in Denver for game five as well five as well so some pivotal stuff here we've got player props up here also got best bets up in a separate episode so make sure to subscribe to that page and continue to follow along for the rest of this postseason each and every day with us also head to the lines.com use that player prop finder tool that we have up there you can go ahead and make sure that you're getting the best odds and lines that are available to you from all of these books giving us player props this nba postseason nate let's get into it the man the 20 20 point man what are we calling alec burks here let's talk about his props yeah, this is what it's come to, Josh. Alec Burks over nine and a half points is is like slightly plus money here, and I think it's very reliable. Um, yeah, he's his nickname is Easy Twenty, and I don't know why Basketball Reference doesn't have that up there. It's been around since he was in Utah, and somebody was just like, "Yeah, he comes off the bench and he's he's an Easy Twenty, uh, and has in fact averaged like twenty per thirty six for a few different teams, but." I mean, with this Knicks team, this during the regular season, I mean, we know what the deal was. He was just like constantly getting getting into Tibbs' doghouse for his defense, and that affected his offense. He actually posted his lowest offensive rating of his career, but his highest usage rate. And I think that's something we can rely on here. 27% usage with the Knicks, um, and now 23.5% usage in these two playoff games where OG went down, and Tibbs is like, well, Shit, I'm out of options. And I mean, Brunson's absolutely limping out there and now is getting an actual defender thrown at him in Neesmith. No offense, Andrew Nemhard. Uh, an actual good matchup. Um, and, and so, I mean, and DiVincenzo, I mean, they're not going to let him keep firing after what happened in game three. So it's like literally like where is our is our tertiary source of offense? It's actually Alec Burks, who's I, I mean, he might only play like 22 minutes here, but. He's not out there to defend. He's out there to get his buckets. Uh, 17 points a game, got seven and a half free throws in these two games where the Knicks were kind of getting waxed at times. But, uh, I mean, he's very skilled at attacking closeouts, and, and Indy is still a poor perimeter defense. Like, Aaron Neesmith is, is their guy, and he's just going to be draped on Brunson. Once they get into rotation, if Brunson, I mean, Brunson, I believe, is smart enough to understand how they're defending him and get them in rotation one way or another with some quick passes. Like we remember them trapping him at half court and then just being completely compromised and the other Knicks just capitalizing. And look, Alec Burks knows what to do with it. I mean, he's the only guy on this in this entire rotation who's at least played six seasons in the NBA. He's played 12. He's, a, he's played 25 playoff games, which makes him the most veteran guy in that regard now that OG is down. Um, so, I mean, he's a guy I trust here with the season on the line, even if he only plays like 20 ish minutes, uh, to get 10 points. I think that's, that's pretty reliable. Yeah. I, I think he and, and miles McBride are pretty interchangeable in this. My only reason that maybe I would go with McBride is because I think he's a little bit less, a little bit more blowout proof. Like, I don't know, I, but I don't even know anymore because like you said, it's like just like really trying to find answers in places that we never thought we'd look like Alec Burks. And, uh, and now here we are. So I think both of them are probably, because I still think Dante DiVincenzo has a tough time. Like he still has some more regression to come back from after shooting 56% from deep in three straight games, hitting six threes and all that. Like they don't, they don't gotta, they don't gotta worry about him quite. They don't have to worry about, uh, leaving him anymore for Dante DiVincenzo. McBride might get in there and get a few like point guard minutes as well for Brunson if he can only go the 38 or so that it seems like he'll probably be capped at. I don't know. I'm just in the in the in, in the doldrums about it a little bit, but I think Alec Burks and McBride definitely are definitely going to get hot at the garden. Don't don't you worry about him with this crowd at his back. Which, which one am I talking about here? Burks? Dante. White Dante at oh, MSG White Dante. is not something to fade. Don't start taking under three and a half threes for that man. No, not no. I'm not going to go there with it. Um, I, I didn't even go there last game with it, even though that was the clearly the right time to do it. And you're right, being back at the Garden for White Dante. No, I'm not. I'm not fading him. But I think there'll be some more shots available. Like maybe he's not missing them. I do think he has some regression from 56 percent from deep to go through. But I, it doesn't mean he's not going to take 10 threes still. 
that's about as, as many as I think they'll let him take is my main point here. But we'll see if, if Andrew Nemhart continues to be a, a pincushion for abuse. But um, he's no longer guarding Jalen Brunson. Aaron Neesmith is. So I'm going under 32 and a half points for my already favorite Nick of all time. Let's be honest. Um, and, and the dude who's, who's uh, just going to be re- relied upon continuously, but like 26 shots. He took that two games ago, right? We had the 29 points there against Neesmith. And that's really what this comes down to more than anything. The foot came at the, the foot injury came at the same time as Rick Carlisle putting Neesmith on him instead of Nemhard. Um, and then you, you couple that with the fact that, um, you know, now, now he's also getting like the foot just gets worse because on defense, if you look at the way that, that they're running stuff, Nemhard has been the role man, um, for the last two games and Neesmith has been the role man for Tyrese Halliburton in the pick and roll almost as much as Miles Turner, because that's the dude that Jalen Brunson is guarding. It's one of those dudes who's normally on the wing or in the corner and they're trying to hide him as much as they can. But then Rick Carlisle is like, whoever is, gu- is being guarded by Brunson, you are the role man. Um, so now he's got to get into that action and that's really affected him as well a lot. And you'd have to kind of watch that or go to some like role man stats that you can find how often he's doing it and his frequency has gone up. Like Neesmith and Nemhart have just been doing it so much. I, I, it's going to impact him on defense as well uh, or on offense rather as well. And like I was saying with Nemhard, 10 for 13 in games one and two uh, against him and, and barely missing ever. In fact, I think he was a little bit better, but the, the tracking data crapped out on the NBA in game two of this of this series, which was really weird. So you only get like a half's worth of information if you're looking at tracking data. Pretty annoying. But either way, um, it's if you look at games three and four, we have plenty of data to show Neesmith being the, the primary defender. And him turning out nine for twenty five from Jalen in the in those situations. It's what I keep coming back to. It's not like this is a fluke or something that they've like figured out. Uh, they, they're still running the same offense for the Knicks, where it's like, okay, well, we don't even, we're gonna still run that pick and roll with Hardenstein uh, and hope that that then either leaves Hardenstein free. But the problem is, is they're not bringing an extra defender anymore from the wing. So now Brunson is is like it's in one on one defense with really not very many options other than Hardenstein. But once Hardenstein gets that thing too, he's in trouble. But the main point here is like the threes have not been there for him against Neesmith. Very very difficult to get that shot up that he's that quick trigger that he's hoped for. He, every time Nemhard's guarded him, he's he's pulled at least two threes. And Nemhard guarded him last game even when he only played thirty minutes for like a minute and a half as the primary defender. Pulled both his threes, missed them, but pulled them um, against Nemhard because that's at least somebody who he can get a shot up over instead of Neesmith. Smith, right so you just see him like looking for ways to get around his dude uh and they're just not quite there and it, when it comes down to the the way he was scoring the most it was all in the mid-range right or in the extended paint and that's not a shot that he can get up over Neesmith either so uh, it, it's not just like okay you know the defender change coupled with the injury coupled with Rick Carlisle figuring a couple other things out on offense to to really force um Jalen Brunson to use as much of his energy on defense. It all comes to fruition in game 92 of the season or whatever. And and I just don't think he's going to be capable of continuing the 33 to 35 points that he was scoring before the injury. Yeah. I mean, I got to sit it out until I see, you know, what, again, this MSG magic really brings to raw. Like I'm not fading DiVincenzo or Brunson because I feel feel like we'll look up and somehow the Knicks are in this game after getting absolutely crushed. Uh, It's just a different situation now. It could, but I mean, the logic is sound for sure. I just, I just not, I'm not going to fade this man. He's been the best player in the playoffs and on an individual basis, I guess, basically. Uh, and, and I, I, if maybe if it was in Indy, I could see them like going out with a whimper, but like, no, no, not at MSG. Um, we'll see. Uh, cat though, under 21 and a half points and assists. I'm going to leave the eight rebounds out of this, uh, because I mean, he could stumble into some boards for sure. Denver might actually miss some shots, which they did not in game four. And Cat still had a bunch of rebounds, but man, was he a disaster on offense. I mean, we all saw it. It was just like Ant's going off and Cat's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to step up and be the be the Robin to his Batman. He shoots one for 10 in the first half. Like literally Denver had the four of the five best guys on the court and one of the, and the last one was Cat, right? Like it was like Ant Edwards and then, and then Cat, like, basically contributing to everything Denver wanted did. It reminded me of uh, somebody suggested the Mavs should let Giddy, like, score eight straight points so that he then stays on the floor <laughs> for the entire game. I think Denver was like, let's let Cat get going. Let's let, let's switch KCP onto him, see if he can bully him, and then he'll just keep going to the basket. And he didn't score once when there was a smaller player on him. It was just a turnover or a brick shot, and then he's rushing. Oh, my God. It was unsightly. So the scoring, we understand. I mean – from a sheer usage standpoint should take a step back. Right. I mean, the wolves have to talk to him about like 
picking your spots and like keeping the offense moving and like understanding and Edwards is, is on your team and can get 40 every night. Um, I mean, the spacing, if he's not going to be hitting, which I mean, he did in game three, right. And he still went way under all this. He still went under this in game one because of the foul trouble. Uh, but the spacing and is another threat in terms of like Nas Reed might play more because he's just a, a better spacer, a more in control offensive player. I, I have to say the rebound stuff. I mean, it, it is possible to fade it just because game one in Denver, only five rebound chances for cat versus 21 for Gobert, And then he gets 12 boards in the next game in game two. That's the only time he's gone over his PRA prop in the series. And he had 20 points in that first half that, which is apparently an outlier half where the wolves play the best half they might ever play as a franchise. Um, but the assists is what's really fadeable here because last game, the last two games, three assists on three potential assists per game. That is exactly what we call searching for some regression. And throughout the playoffs, two and a half assists on three and a, and a half potential. So almost every pass he's kicking out is, is getting finished. Uh, lucky for him, he's only making 29 passes a game. He even got lucky in, in the regular season against Denver, four assists on five potential assists. But now that Denver defense is locked in, uh, they have forced him into, like I said, a bunch of mistakes where he thinks he can bully somebody, and then it's it's a it's a it's a bad look. Um, two passes only on his 14 drives in these last two games, and both have resulted in a turnover. And since since the 22 playoffs, two assists, three turnovers per game on the road in the playoffs. So I would consider just taking the plus 120 on him going under two and a half assists, uh, which seems worth it based on those those advanced stats to just be like look i don't think he's very reliable for three assists aside from the fact i mean the concern that maybe he he takes a step back in the offense after having like a truly dreadful game maybe i i don't know enough of, I, I don't know maybe i don't know enough about cat's psyche to understand what he's going to do after that um I, I, I don't think he's going to pass. I, I, I do like the points and assists under. So like, I, I, it's a little bit ballsy because obviously it's just like, well, his, his potential assists are coming on probably like some pretty easy shots or open threes. I would imagine if he's that high of a success rate, but I'm totally fine fading cat in a game that like, I think somebody has got to have told him less is more. It's just a matter if he's going to uh, actually pay attention to that. But um, I'm going to close it out here with, uh, uh, with another over relevant to, uh, to Jalen Brunson's under actually. And it's Aaron Neesmith because I just think that the, the minutes will keep being there for him. So I'm going over on the PR with him over 14 and a half minus half, minus one twenty. Um for Neesmith. Like, yeah, he had 12 boards last or 12. Yeah. It was 12 boards on like, 18 rebound chances, basically 50, whatever it was in the like 30 minutes, not even 30, 24 minutes, 28 minutes that he played. Like the last game wasn't a real game, but you can take something from the beginning. Now, I don't think he's going to have that many, but everything's been going steadily up for him for this series, his minutes, his rebound chances, everything, because he's on the floor for more time now. And he's clearly been labeled the, the, the Brunson defender at this point, which well done, Rick, Rick Carlisle. We'll say it again. He's gone over in three or four of this series uh, with, with both of these. You put them together. It's a lot better. Uh, and in, in the, the minutes that I was talking about went from 31 to 34 to 38 in game three, then just 24 in that game four massacre. Um, but that was because nobody really needed to play 30 minutes for either side for that game to be determined. It was done at halftime, much less the beginning of the third quarter. So um, either way, though, like everything's just trending in the right direction. Uh, the rebound chances went up in 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 tandem with the, the minutes eight to nine to 12 to 15 last game in just the 24 minutes. Like I said, that number won't be around again because the Knicks won't miss every shot they take. I would imagine like they did in game four. So those rebound chances might dwindle a little bit, but because of the minutes, I think you're still fair to put him at 10 to 12 rebound chances per game. His rebound prop at about four and a half. Now the, the, uh, the points are at nine and a half. I still think those are good too, because if you look at him in game three, he took eight field goals. He got eight points. Um, four of those were threes and he missed all four of his threes. Like, yeah, that's plausible and, and possible to happen again, but one three made obviously. And he's well over the uh, comfortably anyway, over the, the eight and a half from last game, now nine and a half this game, put them both together. Like I, I still think the boards are going to be there. He's been getting at least six or so for most of these games, except for that game two, uh, the, that he still wasn't guarding Brunson and still didn't get quite the same amount of minutes that he's now getting, which you've got a picture that he's mirroring, mirroring 
Brunson's minutes enough to get at least 36, anywhere from 36 to even 40 if Brunson wants to be out there for that long. So they're like maybe they're they're comfortable with McConnell guarding um Jalen Brunson as well, but it's just it's still such a stark difference with Neesmith versus someone who's <clears throat> about the same height as uh, Jalen Brunson. So if you put him at 10 to 12 rebound chances in 36 minutes, which is about what his average would just extrapolate to anyway for, for this series, then yeah, I, I think he's really good to get the, uh, the 14 and a half PR. Foul trouble is what concerns me with Neesmith though. I mean that like, Fair. yeah, everything you said, like he should do a great job. He should mirror Brunson's minutes, but he's also going to be, he's just a little jumpy, right? He's just going to be a little in, in his airspace too much at home. Brunson's going to know how to pump fake and get him, in a bit of foul trouble. So maybe, maybe you just want to hedge with some McConnell bets. Cause like you said, like he should be off the bench immediately and be the one guarding Brunson. And we should be done with Nemhart on Brunson at any point, Rick Carlisle, what are you thinking? Uh, yeah. But I mean, e either way, regardless, I, I like TJ McConnell props as well. Uh, only at 14 and a half, 15 and a half points assists at the moment. Uh, and he's flown over in three or four went under in game three, but I, I still think, um, yeah, he's been so key to the Pacers success and getting back in the series. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's still, you know, you still got to cap him at the right amount of minutes here. Um, I think you, you still look at like 22 or so as TJ McConnell's ceiling. That's the only thing that is also working against him. Obviously that's why they call it gambling, man. You gotta, you gotta figure out these, uh, pick your spots here. And, and that's what we're talking about. I think the minutes will help, uh, Neesmith get there. And I, I think the rebounds alone are probably still a good bet. They're just juiced down a bit. So if you prefer not to have to have him score, he'll be out there enough to, to get the boards. I'm sure. And, you got a lot more faith in Brunson in this one than I do. We'll see how it goes. I just think the man's a little bit hurt and doesn't have quite the help that he's going to need anymore. But we'll see. Let's see how it goes on uh, on Tuesday here. That's all the time we've got for you in these play of props. Also have best bets up in a separate episode as we're bringing you both now moving forward every day these playoffs. So until we see you next, happy betting. <laughs> <laughs>